thank you everybody for joining us today and thank you once again, Alex. So since it's uh, a little past one, we'll go ahead and get started right away. So Alex, could you please introduce yourself and give us a brief overview of your career trajectory so far? Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, much a little bit about myself, Alex Shukin. I graduated from um, Baruch College in 2013. Uh, I majored in statistics and quantitative modeling. Uh, when uh, when I was in school, I've uh, I, I kind of knew I always wanted to do something related to business, and, and spent a lot of time trying to figure out what what that was. Um, I, I interned in, in many different types of uh, financial organizations, uh, some startups, and uh, you know ultimately uh, got a full time offer at Credit Suisse in their sales and trading division, focusing on crude oil derivatives. Um, I spent about uh, two years there until Credit Suisse decided to reposition their strategy and, and get out of that business. Um, I had the opportunity to move over to Credit Suisse's asset management business for a short period of time, working uh, at an internal hedge fund before ultimately landing uh, in their M&A division uh, as an analyst uh, in investment banking. Uh, I spent two years you know, in the M&A group there working on a variety of transactions across uh, industrial, IT services, oil and gas, it's a generalist type of experience. Uh, and at which point uh, in 2017, I moved over to uh, American Industrial Partners where, I, where I've been since, so almost for the last five years. Um, and here at AIP, we're uh, an operationally oriented private equity firm focusing on uh, buying and improving uh, industrial businesses, kind of like the name says in, in, um, in North America. Uh, we invest across the industrial landscape. So um, you can think of shipping, uh, manufacturing, distribution, industrial services. Uh, we own and operate companies, for everything from the aerospace industry to um, cabinet manufacturers, to LED lighting, to uh, uh, adult diaper manufacturers to aluminum rolled products. So very broad spectrum of, of what industrial means. Um, and I'm on the transaction side of the house, uh, kind of looking at new opportunities, working with our management teams to execute on strategic initiatives and, um, and selling the companies that we, we own when, they're, when it's time to sell. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. That's you have a very wide range of um, a background in finance. That's wonderful. And you mentioned that you currently are at American Industrial Partners. Would you be able to walk us through a typical day of you know your job within the private equity firm and what that kind of looks like for you? Yeah, I, it's very difficult to describe a typical day. So our our um, at least my work and our business is very project driven. So depending on the project I'm on, it there you can kind of think of the life cycle of a of a of an investment and of a company so sometimes a, a new opportunity comes across my desk and so i spend time researching and trying to understand what does the company do who are their competitors what does the business model look like um you know what is my thesis of why i think this is a good investment or a good business um or maybe it could be just a good business on a bad day and that I can see a pick, you know, a, a path forward to something that's that's more exciting. Um, I we go to management team meetings, spend time visiting sites uh, to see, you know, what what are the facilities that we're actually buying? What does the manufacturing process look like? Um, once we go through this underwriting process, there's a lot of time spent, you know, finan doing financial modeling, putting together a uh, memorandum to help get our firm up to speed as to why we want to buy this business. Um, there's an element of doing all the diligence. So if you think of accounting, tax, um, IP, legal, HR, insurance, benefits, and IT, uh, you know, ESG diligence, um, there's just a whole host of service providers that you need to work with to be able to understand whether, you know, what you're, to really understand what you're buying. Um, and there's a financing element, so working with lenders and banks to help them understand our business and, and to, to borrow money to, to do these acquisitions. Once we own the business, we do something called an operating agenda. So I spend a lot of time with working with our operating partners, thinking about what are the five to seven things that we really want to focus on during our ownership period to improve the business. 
Um, and so that includes hire, you know, if there's no CEO, hiring a CEO, improving the management team, consolidating plans, introducing new products, uh, optimizing procurement, um, all sorts of variety of toolkits that we have uh, to help improve the business. Um, and then when the business, you know, whether it's as we own it, there's an element of uh, recurring governance. So getting on monthly calls, a quarterly board meetings, things like that. Um, and when it's time to sell the business or when it's time to do uh, some sort of strategic initiative like acquire a, a, a bolt-on acquisition or something like that or refinance the business, I spend time working on those things. So uh, trying to explain to potential buyers why they should buy the business that we're selling, why it's a good investment opportunity for them. So there's there's a whole life cycle of, of this opportunity uh, of, of my job and depending on any given day I'm working on things that I'm selling and some things that I'm buying, managing, and so it, it fluctuates uh, from time to time. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I kind of want to ask you a little bit more about that because you mentioned how, you know, there's a lot of like going on sites, a lot of meetings. So I'm assuming traveling was probably something that you may have done um, prior to COVID, but kind of along these lines, has there been a significant change in the way you go about your day-to-day -day work uh, pre-COVID and then now, you know, during COVID and kind of as we're getting back to normal, have there been any major changes? Yeah, huge, huge changes. Uh, I mean, before COVID, I was traveling probably uh, two weeks out of the month, um, which is a decent amount. There, we have some of our operating partners that travel, you know, 51 weeks out of the year. <laughs> Uh, so, th but they're very much on site, you know, work in, in our plants, working with our management teams. Um, during COVID, everything became virtual, even things that we used to do and want to do in person, like site tours and seeing assets. You know, everyone started using video technology or drones to, hey, come look at this plant, but you don't have to leave your living room. Um, and a lot of processes have become accelerated because people have gotten used to just processing information from home, asking a bunch of questions, getting on a bunch of video calls, watching a bunch of uh, you know, videos about what's going on and not having to spend the time getting into airports or meetings or all sorts of other things. So that definitely changed our industry. Um, today, it's coming a little bit more back to normal. Like for example, yesterday I was in North Carolina, we were visiting a plant and sitting down with our management team um, to talk about our operating plan. I'm going to Dallas on Monday for a management presentation. So things are starting to come back and, and I think travel is becoming more common, but there's definitely a, a lot more video interaction. And I think that's gonna continue for the foreseeable future. Yeah, that's really wonderful that there's kind of a mix, a hybrid. Um, and you know, thank you for joining us. You're very busy and traveling back. I'm sure that's very tiring. So thank you for taking the time to be with us. Uh, I just wanna quickly add that um, we do have, we will save some time uh, towards the end for Q&A from students, but we are a very small group. So if anybody has questions, please feel free to drop it in the chat box and I'll try to get to them um, as we go through this moderated portion of the event. But kind of moving on with that, uh, what would you say is the most fulfilling and exciting part of your work? It's a great question. Um, you know, I, I, the thing that I realized after joining AIP is, is the work that we do is very tangible, very impactful. We, we buy companies, the companies that we buy, if you think of all of our, our entire portfolio, we have some, you know, a little north of 25 companies. It's, it's about 60,000 employees. And, you know, there's people's lives and their jobs, what they, what, you know, their, their careers, uh, all of those things matter. And so the decisions that you get to make and participate in and how you think about improving the businesses and growing them, um, all of those decisions and the, the, the teams that I get to work on that help craft those strategies really impact people's lives. So that's for me, very exciting and, and very personal and very tangible. Um, it's not something you get to do in many other walks of life. And, and so for, I, I really enjoy that part. So it's at the end of the day, there's a lot of presentations and spreadsheets and data and all sorts of other things. But at the end of the day, it's a people business and it comes down to people wanting to win, wanting to make uh, decisions and put in the effort to grow their business and, and improve. And it ultimately becomes very rewarding for everyone involved. 
Yeah, I can, I can imagine how that satisfaction feeling is like, you know, at the end of the day, seeing how the decisions you make and the roles that you play really make a difference in the community. And so kind of talking along, you know, putting in efforts, um, you are also a Macaulay alum. And I was wondering if you can kind of talk to us about either your own experience uh, in Macaulay as an undergraduate student, or also just about the transition from, you know, graduating into working full time, you know, what was that process like for you? Yeah, I think, well, my own experience as Macaulay uh, undergrad was fantastic. I think Macaulay uh, gave us so many resources uh, for through the program. It was one of the key, dis, you know, dis differentiating factors for me of deciding to come here. Just the level of resources, the small community feel, uh, be, get, you know, getting access to different opportunities. Uh, it, it was um, a lot of diversity. It was it was a lot great experience overall so I can't speak highly enough of it um, and in terms of transitioning out of uh, school and into the workforce I, I think it's a it's it's it was a, I think easier for me because I spent a lot of time during college interning so I would work you know 20 to 25 hours a week and then go to school and I would work in like a wealth management office or a asset management group, or, uh, you know, I, I knew what it was like to work in an office environment. So, um, and I knew the types of people and personalities and every group is different, but uh, it was a little smoother, I think for me and the group that I joined right out of school, I, I interned with them uh, the prior summer. So I knew the people and the personalities and the, and the type of work that I would be doing, but uh, it, it is a, it is a change. So it's, a, you have to just kind of Come, in, come at it with an open mind and be willing to learn and absorb as much information. There's so much out there to, 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 to kind of, that you don't get in school that you just pick up on the job uh, that, that you just need to be ready to, and willing to, to jump into and roll up your sleeves and really address. Yeah, internships, I think definitely are always helpful for us to be able to adjust to, you know, the working environment after graduation. And so I think that's a very helpful piece of advice. And Kind of along the lines of you know school, uh, I noticed you are a CFA chart holder. So I was wondering, could you tell us a little bit more about you know what that means and your experience in becoming a CFA chart holder? Yeah. So the the having uh, a CFA charter uh, means that you've gone through a rigorous educational program uh, that is comprised of three exams that that capture a very wide spectrum um, of financial topics, everything from uh, you know, the financial statement analysis to fixed income instruments, to wealth management advice, to ethical uh, decision-making in, in terms of providing uh, financial advice. Um, and that culminates in hundreds and hundreds of hours and, and thousands of pages of material that you have to absorb uh, over a multi-year period. So a lot, some people will equate the curriculum to a MBA in some cases, if you, if you take a very financial focused MBA. Um, it was a great tool in terms of augmenting my skill set, and it, but it, it is a tool that is industry specific. So if you, if you wanna work in uh, equity research or fixed income research or asset management or hedge, in hedge funds, a wealth management, I think the CFA uh, goes a very long way because it tells, teaches you a lot of technical skills that are very relevant for those types of jobs. Uh, in, in private equity, it's, it's a little, and investment banking, it's a little less relevant because you spend more time thinking about um, how to do deals and like the mathematics and the technicals of, of doing deals is uh, not very difficult and can be learned on the job. And it's more about thinking about strategy and, and people and um, uh, in, you know, what kind of investments you're making. So it's, it, it's definitely a little bit, there's a lot of numbers, but it's a little bit more qualitative. But I think the CFA curriculum is fantastic and I continue to uphold my, my charter status. Yeah, uh, that's really wonderful that, you know, you were able to uh, complete that and you continue to hold the charter status. Uh, but I know you mentioned how, you know, sometimes uh, individuals who are within the business or finance industry consider either pursuing these charters or maybe other kinds of licenses or even an MBA. Was there, you know, do you have any advice for undergraduate business students about 
how they can maybe distinguish whether they want to pursue like getting a CFA charter or if they want to pursue getting an MBA or if you yourself considered going back, you know, to grad school to get an MBA or, you know, what um, advice in general do you have about these? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, it ultimately depends on what you're trying to accomplish with your career. I think if you are um, someone that wants to work in like the fields of equity research, hedge funds, asset management, um, th those are types of fields uh, that take well to the CFA and the CFA hold, carries a lot of weight there. Um, so I, I think if you wanna go work in those fields, getting a CFA is very additive to, to your career trajectory. Um, I think the MBA is more, um, it's, it, it's an expensive track uh, and time consuming uh, because you can do a, a CFA while you're working versus an MBA. Some people take you know, part-time MBAs, but typically an MBA, you get the most benefit when you're full-time and making connections with people and building your network. Uh, an MBA is very good to have a well-rounded education in business. And if uh, people have had one type of career in the past, an MBA is a great tool to uh, reset and, and pivot your career to something else in an accelerated fashion, build connections. So I think for me personally, I really enjoy what I do. And I, I don't necessarily, my firm doesn't require an MBA to, to progress in, in my career. And so I, and it's a very competitive field uh, in private equity. So I don't really see a need to give up my spot where I enjoy what I do. I, I enjoy who I do it with and, uh, and, and take that you know, two years out to, to go get an MBA. Yeah, that's really comforting that, you know, depending on what specific part of business or finance you want to go into that you don't necessarily need an MBA, but there are other options such as the CFA charter. And uh, we have one question here from Antar. Uh, please correct me if I'm saying your name wrong. Uh, the, they are asking, what are the requirements you need to meet prior to taking the CFA? Uh, none. I think you can take the first level while you're in school. Um, I think you, there is some, in order to get the full charter, even after you pass your first three exam, for the, the three exams, you need some amount of relevant work experience, uh, but you can take the first exam, you know, today. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. If, you know, whenever you're ready for it, you can just go ahead and take that and the flexibility that's involved. And so, uh, Alex, I know you had mentioned, you know, working in like private equity and kind of that's kind of always been your track. So I'm wondering what made you decide to pursue a career in finance and then kind of maybe specifically how you got into like the hedge funds, the private equity, uh, things along that line. Yeah, I didn't know I wanted to work in private equity um, at first, actually, I my my dream job it was all, all I knew is how to articulate what what I kind of conceptually wanted to have with a career and for me I was somebody that wanted to I was very quantitative um, and I wanted to work in a field where you're given a lot of information and you're processing that information trying to synthesize it into a thesis uh, in some in some ways, you can call it like a three dimensional puzzle or a multivariate puzzle, um, and and you're taking that thesis and then you're acting on it, and that's really the important thing for me. You, you you come up with an idea and you act on it, and if you're right, you get you you, you feel like you win, you feel like you've uh, you get compensated, and if you're wrong, you there you know there's always the the, the threat that you uh, you know you you lose or you get fired or or you made a bad decision and you lost money. Um, and, and so what I really enjoy about um, the field that I'm in is that you're, you have this agency of, of being able to make important decisions, see how they play out and get rewarded or, or penalized based on the outcomes. And there's not a lot of, in my mind, um, other fields that let you do that. Now, when I first started out, I always thought that, you know, um, going into trading or hedge funds was a way to do that. And, you know, when I was trading oil derivatives, I would sit in front of seven different computer screens, you know, your eyes would go 
uh, in all different directions. Uh, you're, and you're reading about uh, what's going on in Libya and what is the Fed doing. And, and then you're seeing the, the, the reaction in the market and you're reading equity research and you're, you're chatting with other people, market participants and all of this information inflow was very exciting and you're trying to make decisions in real time about what's the right move to do in any given day. Uh, and I thought that was a very exciting career. I, I, I really enjoyed my time. Um, what I really like about private equity is you get a little bit more time to think. You're making longer term decisions. Our funds are 10 year long funds. There's a lot of patient capital where our investors are Know, teachers pension funds and children's hospital endowments and university endowments and uh, insurance companies. So we, um, uh, we, you know, we manage money on behalf of people that trust us to help deliver returns for them so that they can provide uh, support and, and, you know, very critical funds to their constituencies and for their missions. Um, and so here we have long dated capital and we have time to think and make decisions and be strategic about where we want to go with our investments versus very tactical and day to day. So, but, but still in, in private equity, despite having this long dated horizon, there's still a lot of information that you're processing. You know, what are my competitors doing? Where's the industry going? What are some of the trends impacting my, my strategy? Um, how are my manufacturing operations performing? Am I introducing the right products? Um, you know, all sorts of things that uh, all these factors that uh, come together in a way that you don't, there's never a perfect answer, but you need to make a call at some point, make a decision and, and, and hope you're right, which is, which is the exciting part about it. Yeah, that's really interesting how, you know, there are differences just between you moving from, you um, like hedge funds into like a private equity and the wide variety that, you know, finance careers have. And I know you mentioned before, you know, it's very satisfying getting to see the results pay off when you do make these long-term decisions. So what is a time in your career or maybe a specific experience or achievement that you are the most proud of so far? Most proud of so far? Um, no, I don't, I don't know if I have necessarily like a most proud moment. Um, you know, when you talk about your deals or the companies that you work with, you kind of love your children all equally, <laughs> uh, if you can call them that. Uh, I've really enjoyed working very closely with um, one of our companies that is a global mining consumable company. I've spent, uh, you know, months and months in Omaha kind of working with the CEO, traveling with him and seeing him you know, take the culture of this company that's a hundred year old company and really transform it into a much more agile, um, you know, entrepreneurial, aggressive and, 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 and opportunistic type of place that everyone likes to win. Everyone has a lot of fun and everyone works really hard and seeing that transformation and being a part of the team that helped created is has been very rewarding yeah i'm sure there's definitely that being a part of that process is very amazing like you said and uh, we actually have a follow-up question uh this one says uh, i was wondering if you could tell us about your transition into trading derivatives transition it, it, well that was my first job out of school um I, I don't know if there was a transition it is a it wasn't an easy job so Things are flying around very quickly. Uh, people are yelling into phones and information's coming across in seven different screens. And you're you know, making decisions. Uh, and in the trading world, your word is your bond. You, you don't, you, you, you say, someone says, you know, uh, can, I want to buy this from you at this price. And you say, you're done. You're done means you're done. Uh, and whether you know, you don't go back, oh, I'm sorry, I, I really thought it was 75 instead of 65, you know, this is costing me $10 million. They'd be like, um, you're done as you're done, right? So uh, it is stressful. Obviously, they don't let you just play with live bullets day one. Uh, so you, you kind of work your way into it. But uh, being very detail-oriented, not making mistakes, um, constantly being focused is um, was exhausting and tiring. And so, so, so part of that transition is um, was, was challenging, but it was like exciting to be in the middle of it all. 
Um, right. And so you just kind of bouncing off of what you're saying, how, you know, you make decisions and once it's said, there's no taking your word back really. And so do you have any advice about what skills in particular kind of really help like anyone interested in going into the industry to navigate? Because I'm sure, you know, everybody has their nerves. So what are some tips maybe you've had to be able to kind of, you know, keep calm? And if you're looking at seven screens, how to not lose focus or maybe dealing with things like imposter syndrome, anything like that? Um, that's a, it's a good question. I, it, you sort of take it day by day. I think the most important um, f- skill sets uh, to have, or maybe mindsets, I'll say mindset, the most important few mindsets to have, A, is you need to be self-aware of your strengths and weaknesses. And you need to be incredibly humble that you don't know everything that there is to know under the sun. Actually, most likely, you know very little. Uh, and you're coming in and working with people that have decades of experience and, and you should take that opportunity to learn from them. The third mindset I think is very important is intellectual curiosity. Um, so you, you want to ask questions, you want to be thoughtful, you want to uh, try to absorb, be a sponge early on in your career. Um, and then the last thing, this is more of a uh, not a mindset, but a, 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 an approach. It's, it's, you have to work hard. You have to be willing to work hard. Uh, nothing comes easy. Even if you're very talented, um, there, you need to put in the work and the people that put in the work will always um, do better in the long term than the people that, you know, just sort of coast by on some, some base level of talent. Um, and maybe the last thing you need to have is, is a long-term perspective. So everyone's human, people make mistakes. I think you need to own up to those mistakes. And that comes back to being self-aware and humble and say, listen, I made a mistake. Uh, I won't do it again. Don't do it again. And, and just constantly find a way to improve every single day. So uh, I think, I don't, I, I don't know if I've ever had imposter syndrome, but I, I would, I would feel that if people did have imposter syndrome, um, it really comes down to us knowing that the other person on the other side of the table from you has had the similar experience. They also are human. They also make mistakes. And so, uh, you will get there. You just need to put in the work and take the time and, and, and be open-minded. So, um, it's probably the, the most generic, but also best advice I have. Yeah, I think that's very helpful for any industry that you want to go into. It's just, you know, being able to bounce back and learn as we continue to grow. Um, And so kind of along those lines, do you have any advice specifically for, you know, students interested in going into the finance industry, kind of in addition to the mindsets you brought up, or just students who are maybe specifically interested in going into private equity, or maybe even those who are interested in working at your current company? Yeah, uh, so I'll, I'll take those one at a time. Um, to get into finance, finance is very broad and different people have different skill sets and different interests of what they wanna do. Um, and so whether you're working at an insurance company or an asset manager at a bank, at a hedge fund, at a private equity firm, at a financial technology company that services th- this industry, or at a, at a payments company or fintech company like Visa or MasterCard. So it's very, finance is very broad. There's a lot that you can be doing in this space. So you have to really be thoughtful about what it is that you want to do and why the why part is important. And every time I would coach people on interviews uh, and students like uh, that say, I want to go and interview here or there, I would say, figure out your why first. Um, And internships are critical. Networking and internships are critical. And in order to get internships, uh, you have to show interest early on. So if you want to go get an internship in asset management, you better have some stock ideas or trade ideas or, you know, obviously read the news, put in the work up front. Uh, you're never going to just land a, an internship unless you maybe you have family connections or something like that without um, doing some of the work up front. And some of that may be just joining student groups or clubs or managing your own small portfolio, even if it's a paper portfolio. Um, uh, joining associations, taking the first CFA exam, stuff to show that you're committed and interested in, in being in this industry, uh, whatever that may be, Co- competitions or something like that. Now, to get into private equity, um, 
there are few paths to private equity. The most, uh, the most common path is through investment banking. And the reason mostly private equity firms recruit out of investment banking is because A, our, the firms are small. A lot of, uh, my firm is 50 people, uh, 55 people. So um, we don't have the resources or the capabilities to train kids coming out of undergrad with some of the basics. Large banks like JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, uh, I was at Credit Suisse, uh, they have a lot more capabilities to, to formal analyst training programs and so forth to, to give, uh, especially in investment banking students or first year analysts, the skills that they need to be successful. And then we take those base level of skill set and apply them in private equity. But people that go, that go into investment banking can go into venture capital or real estate or corporate or you know corporate development or strategy or uh, private equity or hedge funds or startups. So there's there's a lot of opportunity coming out of that with that just like base level of skill set. Um, and then working at our firm, we we recruit probably three three ish to four ish people a year, uh, typically. Uh, slightly more experienced candidates, so people that have like two, three years of experience in investment banking. Um, the other route to private equity is through consulting. It is a less common route, but some private equity firms appreciate that strategic uh, project management, strategic level thinking, project management skill set, and and they um, and being organized is very important in in all of these roles, um, and so. Hedge fund, sorry, uh, consulting is, is another path to private equity. There are other paths to private equity on the operating side. They take longer. So if you go and you become, uh, work at a company, work your way up to like an operational executive or commercial leader or a CEO uh, or a business divisional leader, though those people have specific areas of expertise in their industry. And we call on those types of people all the time to come join our firms, to come consult with us, to tell us uh, about, you know, about their industry and to teach us and tell, you know, explain to us how, how to think about investments in their space. And sometimes we hire those operating partners. We do at AIP a lot um, to work with us on specific opportunities. So there, there are a couple of ways to get into private equity, but uh, probably investment banking is the, the, quickest uh, and, and easiest, not the easiest route, but the quickest route if you're trying to do transactions and kind of do what I do. Yeah, I think that's really interesting how there are so many maps, uh, road maps you can take essentially to get there and how investment banking is kind of like the stepping stone for many different branches uh, within the finance industry. Um, and so uh, we have a question here from Daniel. It says, uh, as one of the co-founders of Baruch IMG, what are some of the most essential skills you took from the experience? Um, good question. Um, IMG uh, is a great place. Uh, for those of you that don't know about IMG, is it's a it's a student group that that we co-founded uh, in Baruch that manages a portfolio of stocks. Uh, the idea was that kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, if you are committed and want to work in this industry, joining groups and, and developing skills that you will need in the real world is very relevant and, and important. And so we wanted to give an opportunity for students to be able to pick stocks and craft investment ideas and pitch and present. So you develop communication skills, you develop research skills, you develop uh, financial analysis skills. All of those, uh, you can make friends and connections. And so all of those skills were, were very important. Um, and, and that helps you become way more prepared for potential interviews uh, and more, much more marketable. When, when we started IMG and when I left, uh, we had, it was, a, it was a paper money portfolio. So it was a fake portfolio, but people treated it as if it was real money. And when I graduated from Baruch, I, I had the privilege to sit on the Baruch College Fund Endowment Board as a, um, they take one student every year for a three-year rotation uh, to, be, to sit on the board. Uh, and I was able to convince the, the investment committee to give a small allocation to the, Baruch, uh, to the IMG group. They gave them about 250,000 real dollars to invest. Uh, I think they're almost up to a million now. 
And that was, that was 2013, 2014, so seven years later, they have a million dollars in the portfolio, which is fantastic. The market's done well, but you know, they've also done a very good job as well. And uh, you know, the skills that I picked up there, it's, it was more about people management, team management. I, I spent a lot of time crafting uh, organizational design, thinking about you know, who do we wanna bring in, what companies or sectors we wanna invest in, what processes do we wanna to create to allow our students to be as successful as possible? What training do we wanna provide them? So that, that was, um, you know, I, I spent a little bit of time on the investing side with working with them, but as, as the uh, CEO, I spent a lot more time thinking about how to develop our talent and make sure that they're best positioned for success. Uh, that's really amazing that, you know, within this time span of under 10 years that, you know, it's at $1 million now starting from 250000 So I think that's really impressive. Um, uh, we have another question here for Alex. It says, what are the best paths to get involved in equity research as a junior with internship experience in private wealth management? Um, th there's a lot of the best paths. Uh, it's a good question. I, I don't specifically know, but the there are obviously a lot of banks that have equity, all the banks have equity research departments. Um, if you know specifically what kind of industry you want to cover within equity research and whether you want to do fixed income, uh, macro or um, equity research, um, I think you just need to spend time trying to network. They have formal uh, formal rec uh, internship programs over the summer that a lot of them convert into full-time offers uh, for once you graduate. And I don't know if you've had that internship program, but if not, uh, I think your private wealth management experience is very relevant, but uh, so you should, you should try to uh, make sure that when you go interview to talk about that, talk about your interest in stocks or bonds, have ideas that you want to pitch. Like I really like, uh, you know, XYZ company and don't, don't pick the company that everybody else picks. Don't pick Apple or Google. Try to show that you've done a little bit of work thinking about a specific company. Uh, and if you're very creative, you know, you can be very sophisticated, but be careful. The person you're talking to on the other side knows a lot more than you do. So if you go in there saying, you know, I really want to buy $55 calls on Freeport in January, 2023, because I think copper is going to go up, you know, you better be very prepared, well prepared to defend that thesis because they're going to ask you, you know, 50 questions about why, why this strike, what, you know, what's your valuation and why that time period, what are the risks? And all of a sudden you can be down a rabbit hole that you didn't expect and, and you'll prove that you are, you're not as prepared as you think. So you need to have a very well-practiced and solid um, fundamental pitch uh, and you should have two or three, you know, maybe a couple of long, a couple of short, uh, and that shows that you're committed and you're, you're spending the time to, to, to really get to know the industry and, and uh, develop your skill sets. Yeah, so I'm going to bounce off of this question a little bit. Uh, you mentioned how, you know, sometimes maybe in an interview, you may not be as prepared for a certain question. And so you have to be very careful with your answers. But uh, I'm kind of wondering, you know, was there a time in your career specifically where you faced a significant challenge or setback? And what did you learn from it? Any advice about, you know, moving forward with those kind of situations? Yeah, I actually, uh, early on in my career, faced, uh, faced a, a number of setbacks. So when, uh, when I joined the credit, Credit Suisse in the uh, you know, crude oil derivatives group uh, within the first like 15 months credit, like I, I mentioned, Credit Suisse decided to restructure and they exited the commodity trading business completely. So a lot of people got fired. Um, I was young enough to, to be flexible and join a different group. Um, and so within the first 15 months of joining something to get fired, it, it's a little scary. You're like, I, I wasn't prepared for this. I thought I was going to be here for at least a few years and it would be my decision of when I get to leave. Um, I joined Credit Suisse Asset Management, a small hedge fund uh, within Credit Suisse. Uh, it was about a $200 million fund look, focusing on event-driven long short equity. And uh, you know that was just kind of when Dodd-Frank and Volcker and all of those rules were kind of really becoming operationalized and having 
hedge fund capital on a balance sheet of a bank became very unpopular. And so they closed down that fund within nine months of me getting there and fired everybody. Um, and so I had to network. They gave me a few months and I had to network my way. You know, they, I just came into work every day just to work on my resume and send out uh, resumes. And I didn't have anything to do other than try to find a job. Uh, and they were very generous to, to, to allow me to do that. And so with, you know, within three, four, five months, I was able to join the investment banking program. Uh, and I had to start over as, even though I had a few years of experience, start over as a first year analyst and pretty much just hit the reset button. Um, and, you know, the people I was starting to work with were just coming out of school two years younger than me. So, uh, I learned a lot from that. I, I learned the value of patient capital. I learned the, you know, what kind of investment style I enjoyed or didn't enjoy. I learned why developing certain skill sets early on in your career is important. So all of those things were, uh, were good learning experiences, but definitely difficult times early on. Yeah, thank you for sharing that with us. I think, you know, sometimes we hope one, we hope some things happen and then other things kind of redirect us, but being able to go into it with such a positive mindset, you know, it's definitely very encouraging. And for those of us who are going to be entering the work industry amidst what's happened with COVID, that's a good thing to keep in mind. And uh, I'm going to ask one last question before I uh, open it up to the students to see if they have any other questions they've they want to ask, but um, what is something that you wish that more people knew about the finance industry in general, or maybe some, you know, stigmas that you think are maybe just overly said, and there's actually a bit more to it? It's a great, great question. Um, I, I don't know, I'm not the lobbyist for the finance industry. Um, you know, I, I think, the finance industry probably gets a bad rap of, you know, people that just move money around and don't really create any value. Um, and I don't think we're doing God's work here, but I think there's people are incredibly smart and work very hard in this industry to help, you know, create the opportunities for other people. So whether it's you know, you're issuing a mortgage or you're uh, lending to a, uh, a company to help fund an acquisition, or if you're helping them get access to capital, or if you're helping, you know, in, in my case, make, you know, the, the, the teacher's fund and the, the children's hospital make money so that they can keep funding their programs and or paying, paying their retirees. Um, I think people don't realize that if you really think about it, my boss is, I have a boss, his boss is, is our limited partners who are, uh, you know, the, the pension funds and insurance companies and endowments and the limited partners that run those investment committees at those endowments and pension funds, their boss effectively are the, the teachers and the workers, the pensioners that expect to receive their checks um, or expect their programs to be funded. And so it all kind of comes full circle. And I think people should appreciate that, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it can, it's easy to forget and think like, oh, these people sit in an ivory tower and move money around and get paid. But um, people work hard, people work a lot of hours. You know, uh, I don't know, uh, in this industry, it's easy to, to work a hundred hours a week, you know, so, you know people, and, uh, and, and, and do that consistently for a long period of time. And so it's, 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 not, it's important to not forget that people work really hard and, and they, they're doing it because they enjoy what they do and, and ultimately the value that they provide actually comes full circle to, to helping the communities that they operate in. Yeah, it's definitely not easy having to clock 100 hour uh, weeks, that's, that's very dedicated and really great insight. Thank you for that. Um, so it is 150, which is perfect timing. So I do wanna open uh, it up to any of our attendees if they would like to ask questions. So you can feel free to you know unmute yourself. Um, there is one question in the chat box already, so I'll go ahead and read that. But afterwards, anybody, please feel free to just unmute and speak, or if you're more comfortable typing in the chat, that's fine too, I'll read them out loud. Uh, this question says, what kind of skills do you recommend we learn before landing a job? Depends what kind of job. 
Do you have, do you have a, something in mind? Uh, Antar, do you want to just unmute if you're comfortable with that? Hello, this is Antar. I was wondering maybe bank analyst or something like trading. Yeah, so for, for two different, very different jobs, but if you're in trading, for example, uh, a quantitative uh, capability is, is very important. More and more trading has become computerized. So understanding um, coding and, and, and uh, automation and is important if you're that disposed, you know, condition to, to does that, that's your core strength. I think one thing that's underappreciated as a skill set within um, any industry, frankly, actually, is is the ability to sell. Uh, and and I personally don't like it because I'm not a very salesy person. But uh, being able to sell, whether you're selling yourself, you're marketing yourself, you're and when you're interviewing, that's exactly what you're doing. Uh, you're selling ideas or products you're trying to convince people that your idea to do some sort of project or some approach is, is better than other opportunities or your idea they people should put money into your idea or um uh, people should believe you or you you, you want to inspire people all of those are uh sales skills that i think could be very valuable in any any role um I, I think a lot of what you're going to learn, unless you go to very technical fields like quantitative trading, where you should absolutely know mathematics and statistics and coding and you know various languages, uh, programming languages. Uh, I think more important is the mind. The talk about the mindsets that you go into these fields with, the the willingness to learn, the humbleness, the intellectual curiosity, the self awareness, uh, and the ability and the willingness to work hard. I think a lot of what you're going to need, you're going to learn on the job. Uh, and so you should spend the time now learning, um, you know, about the industry that you want to go into. So if it's a bank analyst, learning about stocks, uh, different valuation methodologies, learning about accounting and financial statement analysis, things like that. But a lot of that you're going to get trained on the job for. So you should spend your time also learning about things that make you well-rounded and diverse so you can have interesting conversations, networking with people so you have contacts, keeping in touch with your, uh, with all of them is, is very difficult actually when you get into the full world of full-time um, because everyone's busy and has jobs and just wait till they get married and have kids and then you definitely never see them. So uh, it's important to keep up connections um, and play the long game. I, I think that's probably my advice. All right, thank you so much. All right, does anybody else have any questions? If not, I can keep us rolling. Um, I have one question. Oh, go ahead. First of all, thank you so much for coming out. And my question is, with a lot of experience under your belt now, and um, is there anything that you learned like on the job that you wish you knew before coming out of college? So any specific industry tips or lessons that you learned that you wish you knew before? Um, not, not particularly, no, um, really not. I, I have a degree in quant statistics and quantitative modeling and I took classes in C++ and operations research and, uh, stochastic processes. And I've, the, the, the extent of which I use statistics in my day-to-day -day job is to find the average of something and maybe a standard deviation, maybe a linear regression. So uh, I don't, all of those classes to me, I enjoyed them. And so they, they were well worth taking. Uh, I think they're anything that I think expands your, especially in my job, what, what is very valuable is pattern recognition in investments, being able to look at an opportunity and quickly understand whether it's a good opportunity or not, or what are the key critical elements to, to help to that you need to figure out to understand if it's a good opportunity or not. And very successful investors that have been doing it for a long time have great pattern recognition. And if you read or follow Warren Buffett or, or Charlie Munger, their pattern rec recognition is fantastic and they uh, benefit or augment their pattern recognition by reading well outside of investments in finance. So they'll read about 
physics and psychology and you know engineering and philosophy and art and and all sorts of business and that, so to allow them to draw uh, corollaries between the companies that they're looking at and other fields so i think being well read um and 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 reading and learning from the experience of others so reading biographies or or or, or following the stories of successful people, I think help you improve your pattern recognition, which is valuable longer term. So was there a specific class that I wish I took that I didn't take that I needed to for my job success? No, but if I'm thinking about it five, 10 years down the line, you know, I wish I did more of, of, of that, uh, of, the, of the wide reading and, and wide learning. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, I think we have time for about one or maybe two questions. Uh, does anybody else have any questions they want to ask? Going once, going twice. No. All right. Um, I'll end us off with our last question then. So, uh, Alex, you talked about you know like very successful figures like Warren Buffett. I'm wondering if you yourself have had any mentors or just you know many any like colleagues or bosses that you felt taught you a very important lesson or guided you throughout your career that maybe you would be able to share with us? You know, the, for sessions like this, you wish you had like a back pocket of like, uh, you know, you know, Charlie taught me uh, this uh, and uh, I wish I wish I had something like that. I've, I've had tons of mentors um, and mentorship is never an official thing. I think that's an important thing to learn. You're never going to go up to someone and be like, be my mentor. Mentorship is a, is a relationship. It's a, it's a friendship and you spend time with people and I've learned things from my peers. I've learned things from people younger than me. I've learned things from um, my uh, financial leadership program director uh, from, from my bosses. Uh, and, you know, I think uh, it, the, the most important thing, especially when you're in, in the world of full time, it really becomes a day to day thing and day in and day out in order to keep motivating yourself, in order to keep pushing yourself, in order to keep uh, moving forward. Uh, it's easy to get lost in the minutia of the day to day of what day to day means. And um, I think staying curious and staying uh, hungry and never satisfied with your position and always looking for more is an important uh, trait to being successful. And uh, that's probably one thing I've observed over my few short years. Yeah, thank you for that insight. I think asking questions in general is always something that maybe we're always afraid to do, especially when, you know, you're kind of brand new in the in the industry or when you're just starting out as a full time, but um, definitely see the importance of, you know, humbling yourself and learning from those around you. So thank you for that. And so, you know, we're at 58. I'll take the two minutes to kind of wrap up, but thank you so much for joining us again, Alex. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. And for everybody else who has joined us, thank you for joining our session. Uh, before you leave, if you could all please fill out this evaluation form just to let us know how we did. Um, that'd be really appreciated. So uh, Giannina sent the link uh, in the chat. It's just a Google form, a few quick short questions. So if you could please fill that out, we'd really appreciate it. And yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank really you, likewise. Um, all right, so if everybody, you know, you can click the link and uh, I'm going to go ahead and close out the Zoom. So have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you, Alex. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.